As you know, the theme today is about building community through public art and the effects that public art can have on communities. So this idea of practice and of building community through public art is a very powerful one. And it was, to a great degree, part of the inspiration for the exhibition that was mentioned called Doing and Undergoing. It was installed throughout Teachers College this past fall. It was comprised of 22 site-specific works of art placed throughout four buildings and five floors of Teachers College. Participants were led through the exhibition via a very non-traditional experiential audio video guide. Now on one level the exhibition was a celebration of the history of Teachers College and the 125th year anniversary. It was also an embodied experience of the concepts and the learning dynamics that John Dewey describes in Art as Experience. But on another level, it was a conscious act of transforming familiar spaces into something different and unexpected through art. It was also an act of introducing hidden or unexplored spaces to all members of the TC community, inviting them to explore the spaces within the college that they might never have experienced before, even if they had been at the college for many years, and that was truly our experience. So these were the aspects of the exhibition, exploring and instigating the unexpected, bringing people together, working across multiple departments, challenging the status quo a little bit. These were the ideas of, these was, this is what made the idea of putting these artworks into public spaces at TC so intriguing and so exciting. And also the idea that we might foster some you know, new relationships in the process. So it was this that we will be exploring today. So we'll start with the specifics of the doing and, going, doing and undergoing art exhibition. And then we will move on to two examples of public art being used to sort of transform a community. And then we'll move into the larger discussion of informal learning and the ways that art can sometimes contribute to that process. So, here we are. Those are examples of the art at TC and the art being done at, throughout New York City. So a little bit about doing and undergoing. <coughs> As I said, it was site-specific, multimedia art exhibition located throughout Teachers College. It ran from October 15th through December 15th. And it was inspired by the teachings of John Dewey and Art as Experience. So over 200 artwork proposals were submitted and we selected 22. And they were inspired by three themes. One was experiential inquiry, the second was experiment and experience, and the third was doing and undergoing. And this was all made possible through the generous support of the Provost Investment Fund and also through Richard Yocum, who is an associate professor of art education and who conceived of this idea, brought us all together, and is really responsible for this panel discussion today. So Richard, thank you. You did a remarkable job. And one of the remarkable things that Richard did was hire Robert Hero to be our curator for this exhibition. Um, I wanted to give a very quick taste of the um, audio video guide that led the people throughout the college, just so you can see. It was on, they would check out an iPad. <coughs> Um, or not, not an iPad, they had an iPad they could bring in or they'd check out an iPod at the library. And it had a video on there and you would watch the video and walk through the space with the video. So, earbuds in and we would talk. And we'll make sure you do not get lost. Do you know where you are? You're standing in the library of one of the oldest schools of education in the country. It's been around for 125 years. Actually, the building is six years younger. You may have been here before, maybe not. Where is she going? Let's follow her.
This box organizes the universe into two spaces. Assignment. Discuss what can make the inside more appealing than the outside. What would you imagine? Let's go out the door. So of course you're walking through this space in the moment. And these musicians aren't actually there when they're walking through it, but they were there. Before. How lucky we stumbled upon these musicians today. So that gives you a little flavor of like what we were getting at with the uh, so without further ado then I will turn it over to Robert. Thank you, Linda, um, and thank you, Richard, for uh, organizing this. Um, uh, in thinking about the session title, uh, Building Communities Through Public Art, I began wondering, how is it that we form a community or communities? This led me to a second question. How can an artwork be a constitutive feature of community building? More specifically, in the case of doing and undergoing, how can artworks organized into a thematic exhibition be a constitutive feature of community building? It seemed to me that art in and of itself is not community building, but that some artworks can participate in the process of community building depending on the kind or type of capacity they set in motion. The philosopher Hannah Arendt came to mind thinking through these questions. And her thought was that the way in which we live and work together directly creates the community we inhabit. And I'm going to quote Hannah Arendt. To live together in the world means essentially that a world of things is in between those who have it in common as the table is located between those who sit around it. The world, like every in-between, relates and separates men at the same time. So she's saying here that a community actually poses a space of its own through relationships <coughs> and what is shared. Again, to quote Arendt, the space of community is necessarily bounded because no community is imaginable that does not relate, I'm sorry, does, that does not raise a claim to an inside. As the community's own space, this poses the problem, how does a community deal with the outside? So this, I believe, was a central undertaking of doing and undergoing. That is, to break down the conventional distinctions between different communities. <coughs> the different communities of experiencers, since it directly pulls into its orbit these often separate spheres, teachers, students, facilities workers, and even the outside community. My hope as a curator was to break this enclosed fortress-like structure of TC and its five maze-like uh, floors and try to create something like the whole building as an exhibition site, as a space of exhibition. That, then it becomes a kind of reflexive structure. To organize and to distribute the works, the artworks, in such a way that to engage the spaces of transition, the in-between spaces, and so thereby activating these spaces. By doing this, activation of these in-between spaces, then we create a new space and a, a doubling of space in a way. And this is what the philosopher Michel Foucault would call a heterotopia. Heterotopia is a site where at least two spatial grids are at work simultaneously. The idea was to turn the whole structure into an exhibition. This doubling effect on space, that is the working college, and then exhibition site, allows viewers to relate the objects and each other in new ways, in ways that they never would have otherwise. In other words, creating a domain where different people meet each other, breaking down the divisions of the working sites, even 
even through uh, uh, continuously growing systems of relations. So by the multiple alterations and modifications and displacements of the spaces, the installations took place and altered, I would argue, the spectator's perceptions. Here we have an ex uh, uh, artwork by the artist Bill Albertini. This says, to exemplify what I'm saying here, this work was placed in the basement. The basement of Teachers College, if you haven't been there, is really a kind of, uh, the, a kind of heartbeat of this school. This is where, of course, all the facilities people work, and uh, the, the janitorial staff works. Uh, this is where the printing shop is. This is really a kind of, uh, the really working college. So we, have, we place this artwork across from the, uh, the print shop. Um, it made a, a lot of sense to us in that here Bill Albertini is working with, uh, with technology and a kind of the advanced uh, step from uh, printing technology and that is this, uh, uh, this idea, first of all of course uh, video, but also this idea uh, in the video is that he color separates the three uh, the three channels of color, uh, essentially recreating the notion of technicolor. So here we have a, a kind of amplification of the process of the, of the ancient printing process uh, done through technology right across from the print shop. So here we have uh, artist Vicky Michalowicz's work, again, back in the basement. Now here we had a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of site wall that was uh, essentially kind of dissipated and uh, breaking apart. It looks like some work was going to get done there at some point. Um, but we found that this would be uh, an excellent site for, for potential artwork. It seemed to, uh, 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 to expose the structure of the building itself. And again, in, you, in this basement that's quite dark, uh, and it's really, as I said, kind of uh, a bustling working site. In fact, the, the garbage collection is often placed directly across from this, uh, from this exhibit. So here we have we thought the, the, the work would activate this site in a radically different way, in that bringing a kind of growth or life into the spaces. Uh, Artist uh, Catherine Daniels here then took the, uh, the old elevator shaft, the unused, it's no longer used, the elevator, of course, and turned it into a kind of stained glass effect. Uh, again, kind of playing off the notion of the stained glass throughout the site in the building. And Louise Kamser's work, uh, you saw a bit in, the, in that intro. Um, Louise's work really ended up being as Richard uh, Yoakum says, the kind of grandfather of the, of the exhibition. Uh, here, as an educator, uh, and also as an artist working uh, uh, with the idea of education. And here we have uh, artist Kara Davin working through the old lockers, and, uh, and really this idea of the explosion of uh, of collections and uh, and color coming through the coming through the space of the lockers, and here it might be mentioned uh, with Kara's work that uh, preschoolers came through the exhibition uh, and uh, really took to the work and decided they would create their own locker works. And so across from this piece were a series of preschool artworks in the lockers as well. Uh, and this is uh, Heladon's work, and I think he'll be talking about that. So. I won't, actually. No. Okay. <laughs> you want to hear a little something about it? <laughs> uh, perhaps you'll say it. So, yeah, there's a close-up. So, thank you, Robert. Is there any concluding remarks you'd like to say? Well, I just, uh, I, I simply think that, uh, that I think it was uh, a very successful um, exhibition in that we saw, uh, we, we really did see these, these uh, spaces activated. We saw how uh, both the, the working staff and the facilities of the, uh, of the college and also the students, uh, it really affected their perception and their, their daily experiences. And that's precisely what we were trying to do, to break free of this habitual 
sort of thinking uh, that we fall that we all fall into, and to create uh, a kind of real, active, and dynamic space. Thank you. So, next, Haladan, Kirti. All right. Um, Do you want to say a little bit about the piece? You know, I'm going to. I'm going to leave. <laughs> I'm feeling the pressure now. <laughs> um, yeah, when I, when I heard that. Uh, Robert was going to be the first to present and, and present the show. I, I, uh, I understood that he was going to, you know, sort of talk a little bit about the whole show. So I thought I'll use that opportunity to talk about another project, sort of to enrich the discussion with another project. Um, so, um, so therefore, I won't talk about that one. <laughs> and, um, so um, the project I would like to talk about, it's a, it's a, it's a big public project uh, that I participated in sort of as a soldier, um, which I, I believe in sort of being a soldier in, in public projects. Uh, that's, you know, that's the difference between sort of like a, an artist that, you know, like, um, like in a gallery or a museum space with a public project, uh, like your, your positioning is completely different. Like you have to really think about the public first. Uh, which is like when you are in your own, like studio and thinking like uh, working sort of like Paul of vain, then you know like it's, it comes from you first. It's, uh, it's, it's a completely different way of mindset. Uh, so uh, this project, it's uh, starting about like a, in the year 2000 in Tirana uh, with um, uh, the, the new mayor that just became like a year prior uh, was an artist and uh, like Eddie Rama. And uh, it, it was quite an astonishing uh, thing to see Tirana that year that was sort of like a, um, it seemed like a city that, that you need to, to leave alone and start a new city. Because it was like 10 years after the Berlin Wall fall, and Tirana used to be like about uh, 250,000 people, and from that it went to a million uh, within, within a, a few years. And um, so it changed from a system of being a, uh, like a highly centralized, dictatorial, uh, communist uh, system into a free market system. And of course, the change was overnight, was like what they called uh, uh, a sh shock economy, something like that, <laughs> something shocking. It turned to be very shocking. And uh, so people felt like, uh, okay, now we are free. Finally, we are free. We can do whatever we want. And free meant that uh, they didn't uh, care about public anymore. It was about me. So it was like me versus the public. Therefore, all the public spaces started to disappear within a few weeks, within a few months. Uh, within a few years there, were the years, there were no more public spaces. Uh, people took over all parks, sidewalks, whenever they put their hands. And the government was very, you know, sort of, okay, well, it's sort of like, Far West, I guess they had seen a lot of uh, Western movies prior to that, <laughs> and uh, so uh, so the city was completely uh, uh, overtaken by by illegal construction, and there was this sort of like non-architecture happening. So you know everybody was in, uh, sort of their own architect, but there was no sort of like wholesome uh, thinking about <laughs> uh, the community and and, and and in a context, but just about your needs. And nobody was taking permissions, of course, it was all, you know, like, just take it over, cut the tree, take the bench out, you know, build a little kiosk. And then eventually the kiosk turned into, <coughs> turned into a little, uh, you know, when they start making money, like one floor building. And by, the, by ten, in 10 years, it turned into five year, uh, five year, five floor buildings. Uh, there were lots of those as well. Uh, so when the mayor came, we all were like very happy. He was my professor at the, at the Academy of Fine Arts uh, to have an artist uh, as a politician. But we were also laughing. We were like, "What is he going to do?" It's like you know, what, what do you expect from an artist in a city that is like so uh, so difficult to work with? Uh, because it's it's you needed to sort of like I, I am an optimist. I felt like you you I, I, you know you have to leave the city alone and start a new one. It was like that bad. Um, so he started like again like with the public uh, public works. He started to like uh, repave the the the, uh, the sidewalks and the streets and, uh, and started to put the lights back on. And so there was like a new energy. One thing, uh, uh, and then he started to take over the par parks. Like he would take one park at a time and uh, like tear down all the illegal buildings and put back the trees, put back the green, put back the benches. 
so it was uh, it was quite astonishing. And he also like was a very astute politician. He would do it sort of one part at a time and, and like not just destroy for the sake of destroying, but literally put back what belonged there in terms of like public space. So the public space started to be regained. Now one thing that uh, of course was really complicated to change and uh, that where his brilliant intervention came, was the, the uh, public buildings that existed from communist areas. So there was this like brutalist architecture that uh, sometimes was also interesting, um, interesting architecture. Um, most of the time was, it, 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 uh, it, uh, it was faithful to its term, terminology, brutal, brutal. But, uh, some, but it was architecture. It had, it had a style, it had a form, it had an idea within it about like people, uh, the modern idea about architecture. And, uh, but people when, uh, like the, one of the good things that the democratic government did at the, when the system changed is that they almost donated these buildings when we were renting them. Uh, and they almost donated because it's like they gave to the people that were living in them for about $250. <coughs> so people became owners. Of course, when they became owners, they thought, oh, I live in the first floor. What about turning my apartment into a restaurant? Isn't that a wonderful idea? And they did. And uh, what about closing this balcony and turning it into a window? And they did. And they did all kinds of things to this building. So they completely got deformed and changed. And there was this like skin around the town and in the, throughout Albania that uh, was, uh, was very unknown creature in terms of architecture. Uh, so his intervention, of course, he could not de demolish these buildings because they, everybody was living in them. They were legal. People were owners. Just because they changed stuff around, still <coughs> couldn't change. So he thought, I'm going to work with the skin in order to change the guts of the building. So he decided to uh, have a team of workers like start painting those buildings, resurface the facades, uh, which was a very basic, uh, cheap intervention, and then painting them. He did these first two streets um, that he did himself as a project, as an artist. He painted them himself, and there were these amazing Mondrian sort of and cubist and, and D style uh, uh, Bauhaus sort of uh, interventions, and uh, so this, the city started to be from a gray, decrepit, sort of abandoned situation into some lively, colorful place. In two thousand and three. Uh, he, the, he was the president of Tirana Biennial, which was a new biennial, like really they did the first one in 2001, was a blockbuster biennial with the biggest names on the planet, they were showing their strength and all that. It was highly competing with Venice Biennial in terms of names, but still was one of these biennials that comes and goes, does not let leave anything with the city. Uh, and he's, he, as a president, uh, inv uh, invited a curator, Hans Albrecht, to create one section that was the, 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 uh, the Tirana facades. So that section was a public art section. It was also interesting like, in terms of like a format of a biennial, instead of, again, something that is fleeting, into something that you have that section where it comes and goes, but then something that belongs, remains to the people. Uh, so it, it has an attachment to the local culture, to the, lo to the locus. Uh, so, so then, of course, Albrecht, uh, with his, all his might, invited like uh, incredible artists uh, to, to do projects, uh, Ricky Chiravania, and you, you name it, all his crowd. And uh, so, so we have here like amazing public work by these artists that came and intervened. And the whole city started to become this sort of phenomenon of alternative uh, urban development. Uh, so how can you tra uh, transform a public space with very uh, few financial means? And uh, so it, it was like a quite, uh, quite an amazing project that continues still today. Now he's the, he's the uh, president, not the president, the prime minister of Albania. He just became the prime minister. Uh, because he was very successful, he became also, uh, uh, he was elected the best mayor in the, in the world for two years consecutively by United Na uh, Nations, uh, 2004 and 2005. And I had the, uh, the good fortune to be invited to do one of these projects in uh, the fourth year of Biennial. Yeah. Uh, and being uh, local, there were a lot of foreign artists that came to work there. 
uh, I was really uh, interested in the idea of like, uh, you know, like, of course, like the public work, but so, which means that to understand what who the public is. And, and being a local, I really knew the, you know, who are the people living there. I knew the history of these buildings. And what is the history of these buildings? It's the history of, uh, of dictature, of like, a, again, like a uh, sort of communist dictatorship that above these buildings you would have propaganda images, long live the leader, long live uh, Stalin. We are Stalin is still 90s, like the only country. And, uh, and overnight, again, uh, with uh, sort of this Texan style, all these, all these uh, big uh, propaganda images went away. And what came after it? The long live styling turned into long live uh, diapers. So brand name, remind me one. It's not like, so, so it, uh, Pampers, exactly. Uh, long live Coca-Cola. So there was always that sale that, that happened, you know, like it's going from like selling ideology into selling uh, goods. Uh, so, you know, the change of the system was really like represented in, on top of these buildings. So I was really interested to work with that, like what happened with these buildings and how the people felt. So I was interviewing a lot of people that lived in there. And uh, I want, uh, my time is, is limited, so I'm just gonna shoot, tell you just the last thing. And, of, and I worked with the, like, what does it mean, like what's the, the advertising nowadays? So we connect to people. And the advertising, and it works in a different way. It's not about like in your face, sort of like the Las Vegas style, or Times Square style, which exists still, but it's about a sort of advertising that they study who, what you want. Uh, so it's the G Gmail advertising, like you're writing an email and then it comes in your inbox, the offer, because they saw you wrote the word hotel. So I thought to bring the building sort of inside out. So what are they do people doing in their own private life and blow it up in this sort of like, you know, a pop uh, vein. And, um, and so it was, uh, you know, I will stop there, but it was like really interesting, like also to communicate with the people afterwards and have this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we move from Albania to New York City. You know, if you can go ahead, surely. Um, so thank you for having me here today. Um, in preparation for thinking about this panel, Linda and I have been last week about um, this idea of impact, I think, and I could, um, the impact of public art and, you know, how, how do you measure that? How do you start to think about that? So I wanted to share a little bit um, about the history of our program, the Percent of Art program, and um, I brought a few images of recently completed commissions to show you, to give you a sense of um, where we're doing these projects, the different kinds of publics we engage with, and in some cases, um, projects where you could see how we tangibly work with the community, others it's um, a little bit more abstract. But um, the Percent Work Program um, was a local law 65 that was passed in 1982, which says that a percentage, it's actually not 1% anymore really, but that a percentage of the capital budget for newly constructed as well as renovated um, buildings and city owned sites be put towards artwork. Um, so, in the last 30 years, um, a little over 300 projects have been completed. There are commissions um, all throughout the five boroughs. Um, I've brought different kinds of sites to show you today, um, and currently there are, we have about 80 projects underway. So I'm going to zip through these. I know we're limited on time, but I'm happy to answer any questions um, later individually. Um, so um, with that, this is Sarah Z's project in Mott Haven, at the Mott Haven campus in the Bronx. Complementum and its conservation, um, which was completed in 2010. It's um, yes, exactly. Thank you. Um, so it's at a campus um, of four separate schools um, in the atrium where it, the four campuses intersect. So for the students, for the staff, and oftentimes uh, we are very aware that school facilities are used by the local community, community board meetings, etc. Um, so when we commission these projects, we keep that in mind that it's not just for students. Next slide, please. This is Jean Shin's artwork, also in a public school. This one is uh, called Settings. It's in Battery Park City. Um, you can see the artist's uh, medium is plates. So this is an example of um, a, an artist uh, whose own practice is really working with the community. She does this for all different kinds of projects. In this case, she collected dinner plates from the school community as well as larger Battery Park City. Um, so, you know, families, students, staff, um, teachers and use that as a material to kind of bring the social aspect of um, 
collecting from the actual community and use that as her main material in this work. Um, Sorry, what was her name? A Jean Shin. Um, totally different kind of say. This is Vito Conchi's piece at the Big Town Creek Water Pollution Control Plant. Um, we do some projects with the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, this is a much larger scale piece that is a fountain that cuts, um, goes from the outside of the building to the inside of the visitor center there. Oh, where was the fountain? I think. Oh, so it's like it's all of this. And then if you go to the next slide, it's very integrated. So this the darker part is a, All the is water, where the water flows like a snake. Yes, exactly. Uh -huh. Inside and outside the building. Um, Lane Twitchell's piece, this is actually at the Path Family Intake Facility in the Bronx, um, which is where uh, the facility for homeless families. And so the artist created, I believe it's 12 of these translucent artworks showing animals and um, their iconic New York City sites. It's difficult to see at first glance, but the, uh, taking into consideration the site where families will be coming in, sometimes spending hours at a time. It's um, I visited this site last year. You could actually really watch the children spend time uh, picking out animals like this, uh, you know, and attempt to um, bring something uplifting <coughs> into a very difficult site. And was this a commission? Oh yes, all of them are. Um, permanent commissions. And um, this is the last project I uh, brought with me today. It's uh, Ellen Harvey's piece titled Mathematical Star um, at Marcy Plaza in Bed-Stuy, uh, very recently completed. The artist, this is an example of the artist working very closely with the community. Um, so the Mathematical Star, um, or I believe it's called the Bethlehem Star, is a quilt pattern. Um, but in order to determine each of uh, these diamonds, uh, if you could go to the next slide, which are very, very detailed. The artist worked with the local community board as well as other members to uh, solicit what architecturally significant sites for the people in the neighborhood. So um, it's been referred to as kind of a secret history of the neighborhood, that if you are uh, grew up there, you could really um, talk to people who could pick apart, pick apart these pieces and say, oh, that's the uh, stained glass from the church that I went to, um, to so the that's Magnolia actually tree. recycled top tiles made out of recycled neighborhood materials? It's not the material, the, each of the, let's say the Magnolia right there uh -huh. is from a Magnolia tree in the park okay. that the community is um, very fond of. So it was uh, this attempt to bring in um, different perspectives while also creating a piece that stand alone, even if you're not from there, could be appreciated um, as an artwork. And then finally, um, this is a full list of the different sites that we engage. So we're always thinking about who is, we say public art, it's a, a phrase that we use, but in each case it is a different public that we address. So keeping in mind um, also that these publics can change over time. So uh, very, very brief overview um, of some of the work that we do. Thank you. And now you move to so I'm uh, I'm kind of a little switching the tempo because we've been talking about arts that are out there and in this case I'm looking at how arts are used for people when people make meaning of experiences so I'm returning a bit to the John Dewey uh, present suggestions that you had started the session with and when you look at what John Dewey says meaning making is not a solitary activity although many of us make meaning in relatively solitary circumstances but it does require the engagement with others, in others as people, others as ideas, others as objects or animate or inanimate in our environment. And it is that interaction uh, potential that exists that helps to really make meaning. And uh, so we, many of us work in classrooms and in formal structures, and even this panel is very much we're you know, telling things to you. But my area is more in the area of informal learning. And I, I think that that plays a very central role in the meaning making that people have when they experience and engage with art. So uh, a lot of my work has been in workplaces and in organizational settings, but a few years ago we started working on this idea, which Linda got engaged with, of meaning making in the, in the arts and in, very much in public spaces, et cetera. And uh, so 
it's, it is very much, uh, one, of the, one of my colleagues uses the example of an informal learning that you contrast being on a bike rather than on a bus. So if you're on a bus, you go where, where people take you. There are regular stops, etc. But if you're on a bike and it's your own learning, you go wherever you want to go, whatever it is. Uh, but yet it isn't necessarily a solitary activity. So it is often, uh, it's often driven by intentionality in a sense, even though it may not be completely overt or explicit, because it's driven by our interests, and we're interested in it and we go there. Uh, it is informal and it is sometimes and often incidental, uh, in that, for example, today I'm sure that many of the things you never expected to pick up in surprise are sticking in your memory that weren't necessarily something you expected or anticipated to, you know, to find. And so it's that incidental element of surprise that is often uh, really very, very important. And it is intuitive, uh, it's semi-conscious, it's organic. It's also very embedded in context. Um, I want to share an example, and here I'd like to go to the video, if we could, um, with my wonderful <coughs> helper here. Um, this is video of a, a trailer for a show called <coughs> Sisters, which is being played right now in New York. And the reason I'm showing this video is that the woman who created it has built several shows where she's done a content analysis of the top songs. Uh, and through that has ferreted out the patterns in people's experience. And so arts in some ways at a micro level is used from the inside out to engage with one another in meaning making. So if you go to the show Sisters, uh, you will find that the audience very much participates because the songs that are there are the songs they grew up with, that loved, they loved, that helped them make meaning over time in their own lives. And so this trailer for Sisters, if we can show the trailer. After the passing of their grandmother, five women come together to share their grandmother's memories. You did hard enough and you learned a lot about your great-grandmother. Happy day. Oh, happy day. Grandma Alice could have given some stories to that white woman who wrote that help. With the small stuff. Remember, it's, it's all small stuff. <laughs> and to pick a song to honor their grandmother's legacy, they discover the pain they have overcome and the cultural hardships of African American women through music. I'm so tired of this downer talk and all these downer songs. You know what we could use? More Jesus. <laughs> with songs like Single Ladies, A Woman's Word, I Have Nothing, Respect, Stop in the Name of Love, and many, many more. This uplifting musical journey shows the laughter, tears, and accomplishments of these women in sisters. And remember what Grandma Alice always said, when things go bad, don't follow a lie. <laughs> So if you go to see Sisters, or the other uh, show that she created was called Respect the Musical. Uh, when, when we went first to see Respect, uh, the men who were dragged along by the women who took them to it uh, were fearful that they were going to get bashed, that this would be about male bashing. But instead, it really was an uplifting experience to everybody, and the audience participates in these. And so it's very much about a joint meaning making uh, that is very important and that the arts can bring out. And so when I thought about that in relationship to uh, how it is we understand learning, to just share a few insights, if we can go to the next slide here. Um, this, uh, you can just put them all up there. We just have them on the background here. This is, a, uh, this is not John Dewey's framework, but you'll recognize elements of John Dewey's work in this framework. And so the ideas of this are probably universal ideas. This is developed by... Uh, John Heron and Peter Reason in England, and it's the basis for a lot of work they do in collaborative inquiry. And they talk about the fact that when you think about knowing or learning, that there's a bit of a pyramid, and that the part that we often work with as educators is at the top of the pyramid, which is the conceptual kinds of things. And so when we reflect, we're asking people to put their knowledge in bullet points. Our questions about ask them to analyze and to put it out there in that way. But arts work at the bottom part of the pyramid in particular, and that when we are having experiences, we all have different experiences. When we talk in bullet points and concepts, we expect that we know what one another are saying and thinking, but we, we often do not, because we haven't had the time to empathize, to really understand what the basis is for that experience. And so in this kind of learning, uh, the arts greatly aid the possibility that I can understand and hear your experience and it resonates with me. And then together, we can make new experiences together. So I have a friend, and I'm going to share a bit here about another mechanism that I use to do this, which is story work. 
Uh, and she says that when we tell stories together, there are many different stories in the room. There's the story you tell. There's the story I hear, which may be very different than the story that you told. And then there's the story that we make together, so that there's iterations of story in helping us to really understand the meaning that we've made. And so one of the projects that I think illustrates this very well is a project I got involved with a couple of years ago while on sabbatical in Bermuda. And uh, if any of you have been to Bermuda, it's like 22 miles long, and I know there's 65,000 people or something on that island. And it is a very diverse place to be. And uh, I worked on several projects there, and some of the people that I was working with had had a challenge in the education community and where parents really felt that they were being closed out of the conversation about what was right for their kids. And so they were looking around for a model of community engagement that would more effectively engage what parents really think. So we asked them what they had already done, and they've done a lot of things. They did surveys, they did town hall meetings, et cetera, et cetera. But all of the, the output of that was at that top level of the pyramid. It was at the conceptual, analytical level, and it didn't engage experience. So we talked about the idea of using story, which was very natural to many people in Bermuda. And while the colleagues I started working with, they were fearful of the idea of introducing story because they said, these aren't kids, these are parents, these are adults. Well, people just loved it. And so uh, we worked with them to help begin the project in doing some of the training of people who would capture the stories and what, would, what does the story circle look like, how do you work with it. And I was incredibly impressed as we were doing the workshops because people all of a sudden opened up in a way, they could hear one another in a way they weren't able to hear. My story truly was your story. Oh, you experienced that too. And it became, in a way, uh, what you were suggesting earlier, that it was thought-provoking. It was interrupting patterns. It was asking, helping people ask important questions. So the whole idea of this project, and it's still ongoing, is to represent these stories and engage the community in different ways in conversations based on the, uh, the stories that people have shared. And I've just brought a fragment of one of the stories. It's uh, uh, audio. They only do audio in, in Bermuda for a number of reasons. It's like a big, small town. Everybody knows everybody. And consequences of what you say and do can be actually very dangerous for you. Uh, they can have long impact in the community. Uh, even with voice, people can recognize one of those voices because you know they, they know one another. So this is a, fair, it's a fragment, and it, it illustrates, I think, this way in which story can begin to create this community where things begin to touch bells for one another. And it has to do, in this case, with people who are reflecting on the experience of getting a job after you leave education. And re reflecting that, you know, when we left high school, it was hard to get a job. And a lot of it wasn't because we didn't have the skills. It was because they don't hire people like us. And they don't say it quite that way, but you'll hear it as you hear it. And, uh, and now they're reflecting after a, a more advanced academic experience, and they're saying, you know, it's the same thing we're facing now. So things don't really change very much. But what I, why I selected this fragment, in a way, is to be able to hear the way in which they begin to interact with one another as they hear one person reflecting on this piece. That's a bit like when you, when you finish school and you go into the job workforce and stuff like that. And we have talked about this since we were in an Endicott. The thing is, is that when you go job or do something, it's still the same, it doesn't matter, this is 2011, and it's no different now than it was when we rolled back in primary school, it's still the same criteria for getting into somewhere or doing something, mm -hmm. and it, it's very difficult to break that pattern, it seems, because, you know, we've all talked about that, you know, degrees and stuff like that, the opportunity should be there if you are able to do something or want to be someone or whatever. But it, it seems like it's it's still, it's, it's a different day. It's the rules, the people who are in charge, overall in charge, are still the ones saying yes or no. Gives you a little flavor. There are many, many stories up on a site, and they're using it in Bermuda to engage people to talk about their experiences so that they can begin to recreate the idea of education for all in Bermuda. So I'm going to leave with that because I've already shown them. Mm -hmm. so. 
So, well, and that's a good place to pick up because we have a very small snippet of somebody's story who experienced the doing and undergoing exhibition. And these are, well, what do you have to say about it? What is it? Is it on there? There it is. Thank you. <laughs> doing an undergoing exhibit um, affected a lot of people in, in different ways. They had folks coming to the college before would never come to the college. And that was wonderful because they came here to see the art, be part of the experience. There was a wonderful opening. People were talking about it. But also for those of us who've been here a while, I mean, I've been here you know, 20 years, it, it really, um, I couldn't see it at all. And I think this exhibition helped us to have an experience, to be, to stop and look at things a little bit differently, to walk the hallways, even to talk to one another. I thought that was, that was really special about it because um, whether you formed a buddy system and you kind of, you know, turned on the video and you walked through it, whether alone or with somebody else, it kind of gave you something to talk about. And, you know, even the opening, I'd never seen so many people at an opening before here. Um, and we have a lot of good events, but that was, it was a nice mix of, of the college. Just a, across the college, people showed up and they talked about it. And, um, and so I think that's the kind of thing that Dewey would have loved. The hallways of um, down in the basement, you know, we passed through quickly to get from one space to another. But here, you know, you had to stop and look. There were plants growing. There were smells, you know, emitting from the hallways. We had to kind of figure it out a bit. You know, you go upstairs and pass lockers and there's, you know, balloons and, and umbrellas. And it was remarkable because people actually, they may not have understood it, but I think they respected it. Nothing was damaged, nothing was hurt. It just made them stop and look a little bit more than they, they normally would have. So, um, yeah, there was a lot of chatter. I think there's chatter about the artwork, and there's also chatter about the experience that, wow, this really happened. You know, that, um, and it was from all levels. I mean, to have facilities involved, to have students, to have faculty, and faculty not just in arts education, I mean, faculty across the college. Um, administrators, it was, really, it was really something very special. Uh, I mean, the percent changed. Did it go up? No. <laughs> okay. Sure, usually. Um, <laughs> Otherwise, she was going to so say it, right? It used to be one percent of the construction budget. That was the um, kind of the math behind it. But um, 1983 construction costs in 30 years, if you can imagine materials, it has um, skyrocketed, if, if anything. And um, but the artwork there is. Um, Kind of a, we have four hundred thousand dollar cap, so no agency is um, required to spend more than that. So that hasn't been adjusted. Um, that's kind of the short version of that story. Yes, I just, yes, I'm sorry. I said comment. I guess I just noticed like the um, the um, public art um, that or the the artwork that was presented. That I saw a lot of it. Um, what stood out about it was the color differentiation from the environment around it. And that's really interesting because, I mean, most of the works that were shown are in urban environments versus, like, you know, out in nature. And um, I just thought that was an interesting feature, you know, of the works that were shown. Yeah. Sort of they, you trying to bring more color, more, more a sense of nature into an urban space. I mean, we, do either of you have a comment on that? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, it seems that. No, I mean, you don't have to go ahead. No, 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 no. I, I, it seems because I feel it. <laughs> uh, like, no, adding color uh, to, to the urban environment. Uh, like, going back to, to, the, to the Tirana case, um, it was a gray city. Like, when, when you know, this, this, this project I showed you started to happen. And then by putting color, it didn't just like bring, you know, like people say like, oh, this is wonderful, you know, color is wonderful. Like, you know, there are a lot of people, like artists actually like black, right? So, <laughs> uh, so that, you know, don't like color, like grays. Like, and um, Woody Allen says, I like, you know, sort of gray days, I hate sun. So, you know, you, uh, color per se, it's not, doesn't have that quality to change. But it, it does have the quality of provoking. 
uh, it's, it's like really strong. So it did provoke a lot of debate. So like the, 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 the city and the whole country was divided in two. It's like, does this make sense? These, like, these are not our, you know, like, where did this come from? And that energy, like everybody started to become interested in the dialogue that it opened. So that was really important for the public sphere and for the discussion. So that's where, you know, I think that's how that color is. And then it seems like in the New York City projects, I mean, the community mm -hmm. is involved in the conceptualization in dialogue with the artists from the get-go. Right? It was interesting it was mentioned because sometimes, I wonder if maybe when putting together the presentation for today, this idea of impact was uh, really resonated with me. And there are other times when I'll put something together and think, oh, look, they're all circles. Or there might have been something in my mind that kind of put that together. It's, it, it is a range. We, um, work with all different kinds of artists, so um, it's not to say that everything we do is um, a certain element, but I think it must have been on my mind mm -hmm. for today. But it's, what I'm hearing is it's a leveling agent, you know, that people can come together from different walks of life, from different economic structures, and it engages the exchange, and I think that's beautiful. I also appreciated hearing about the storytelling because um, for, for educators who aren't art, arts educators, it's another way to bring artfulness into the classroom, um, which is very, very cool. And do, uh, question though, uh, so, so can, can re you know, regular old educators get to imaginal and effective if they do the storytelling and that's uh, I use the device? I a lot now and I'm using it in a project where we're trying, an action research project where we're working with master teachers of voice in independent schools to understand what mastery is and what's special about that and how they learn to do that. And we use story and it's, and people, this, <coughs> teachers just love it and they, they, they just take to it right away. So I think uh, story is something that Maybe you don't frame it as we're going to tell stories now. We want to know about your experiences, you know, and uh, people just, they engage in it. And it's, cropping, it's cropping up in areas where you <coughs> would probably not expect it. And since there's a whole department now of anecdotal medicine up at PNS uh, Columbia. So mm -hmm. story in medicine, you know, uh, carries an enormous amount of meaning and um, importance that you can't necessarily communicate by dry uh, exposition of facts. Can I mention one more surprising arena? Um, our sort of new CEO of IBM um, says, please managers start every meeting with a story and, and make it meaningful. So, uh, you know, around our practices, it's, uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, things are stories. That, I don't think we have to, ha I don't think we have to disguise the name necessarily yeah. after all. So, you know, in the whole state of Hawaii, talk story, it's like a common thing. Okay, we meet, we go down pier, we talk story. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. it, it's just a part of the culture. Mm -hmm. and, and it still is. You go as a haole and you move in and mm -hmm. you say, okay, we go talk story. You know? It's <laughs> constantly yeah. talk cheese. Yeah, exactly. Same thing, though. Yeah. <laughs> the last question. I really love hearing how the exhibition resonated. Here at Teachers mm -hmm. College, and I was wondering if there was any attempt to keep some of the works, or if that was against the conception of the, the exhibition, or any talk about maybe that should be a part two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Richard, would you like to speak to any of that, or, or um, we we did try to uh, pitch it uh, to the college, uh, and there were um, and um, but uh, but then I mean. The college doesn't really have a collection. We, in our art and art education program, we have a little bit of that. But then still, I feel uh, it's not my position to become the salesperson of the artists involved. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and then a certain temporality of a project is also really nice about it. So, and in that sense, I made a, a actually a, a few, I had a few conversations with uh, across uh, the college and with uh, some some uh, colleagues who were involved. Would you be interested in another iteration? And I wouldn't want to do this on a yearly basis, annually, <laughs> because then we don't see things anymore. But maybe biannually or so. And there was a lot of interest from uh, from uh, across uh, the college, from a lot of people in that. It also puts it at a, at a different position to do something like this in the public recognition. It really opens the door. When do people come to a college? 
such as teachers college you, you go there when you have business you go there when you uh, when when there is the academic festival right that's one of the opportunities but we don't just walk into an institution and can I have a look around you don't do that but with art it's different it's an invitation it opens it exactly and, and it's one of the things I don't think whether it's Columbia or whatever we're talking about, it, art is a destination. You know, some collections actually have like their groupies, you know what I mean? And they follow the collection. And that's kind of what I'm hearing for you, from you. And of course it takes a while to pull things together, right? So we're not talking about boring everything out, everybody out from, from year to year. But um, I hear exactly what you're saying and I'm so for that, you know? I think it's... I think it's wonderful. And I'd like to talk to some of you as, as time moves on about just that concept. Yeah. I had the privilege of seeing the exhibition. And um, there's one that's, they all are wonderful. Right? But there was one that really stood out for me, and that was the one in the library. Books bound. Mm -hmm. It was on a pedestal, books that were opened, and they were bound. And to me, it, it signifies teacher's college. Mm -hmm. Books are valued and they're opened. Mm -hmm. They're not closed. I've seen a similar uh, portrait of a book, but the book was closed and down. But in the library here, the book was open, several books, and they were bound and they were put in a pencil in the library. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a wonderful, wonderful book. Richard? No, Robert? Yeah. Um, had said about public art being like a break in reality. And so I think that's very interesting thinking about um, storytelling as a break in like the routine of the daily and also the color as a kind of break in the routine of the urban environment. Um, having, you know, that kind of connection and, and that, uh, that public art maybe connects in a way that is a break from that routine, like as you had mentioned. I thought that was interesting in terms of the panelists and the variety of things that were presented. Provocative yes. surprise. Absolutely. John Dewey would be very proud <laughs> that, the, that what we've accomplished today. So thank you so much for being here. And thank you to the panelists. It was lovely to see everybody. <laughs> thank you.